We are in our final week of Flannel Graph Heroes. Didn't Kathy do a great job last week? I want to begin this message uh, a little differently than I usually do. I usually tell a story or do something before, but I want to dive right into a, an opening text. And we're back in Judges again. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean to spend almost our entire series in Judges, but I just couldn't get away from it. And God was just opening these characters to me. So let's look at Judges chapter 5, starting with verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. In other words, folks, it was a dangerous time to live. It was an uncertain time to live. It was a scary time, and you, you didn't travel lightly. It was dangerous to do so. Verse 7, villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose a mother in Israel. Verse 8. God chose new leaders. Everybody say new leaders. New leaders. Come on, young people, say new leaders. new leaders. That's right. God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. The enemy was at their door, and nobody was ready to fight. Nobody was prepared. As I read that and studied that, I thought of, of my son, Chuck. We got to visit him a few weeks ago at his new property in Townsend, Tennessee. Anybody go to Cades Cove? That's where he lives, like five miles from the entrance to Cades. It's absolutely gorgeous, and he's built this, this, this man garage. I mean, it's like the, every man's dream. It was a giant three-bay garage with all the bells and whistles and the toys and everything, and they're living in an apartment above that while they finish their, their house. So I was, we were downstairs and the kids were playing and I went into the lower bathroom to use the bathroom. And I could barely get into the bathroom. I was like this, trying, I couldn't even move. I came out, it was full of weapons, of guns. I mean, full. And I came, <laughs> I came out, I was like, Chuck. Dear God, son, what in the world? <laughs> and he said, man, he said, I really need to, to get a, a gun case or gun uh, safe for these. He said, the problem is the biggest one I can find, this is what he said, will only hold, only hold 60 guns. <laughs> only? You have more than 60? He goes, oh, yeah. And ammunition to go with it. So as I read these, these, as I read, now he, Chuck got into the, Chuck got into the Doomsday Preppers. Anybody watch that show? Come on. All right. I'm going to keep my eyes on, oh, no. I, I'm going to come to your house, actually. The Doomsday, he, they absolutely loved it. And I'm telling you, he, he, he's dedicated an entire section of this garage with, with, you know, containers full of bottled water and gas masks, and MREs, and canned goods, and of course the weapons everywhere. There's a weapon everywhere. I'm serious. It's just un... You walk by and there's a gun. Just I mean, it's... It, <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. If, if, if we have the zombie apocalypse, I know where I'm going, except <laughs> when I get to his gate, because he has a gate too, I, I just want to make sure I let him know who's there, because he's going to shoot first, I'm sure. And ask questions later. But, you know, uh, Chuck was pre is prepared as opposed to these Israelites who were not. Now, again, I... <laughs> right? So, again, I didn't plan on being in Judges, but here we are uh, once again. But today we don't have a flannel graph hero. We have a flannel graph shiro. Come on, ladies. Yeah. Woo! Today we're going to talk about Deborah. We're going to talk about Deborah. Now the portion of scripture that we just read is actually the end of the story. It's actually a song that she wrote at the end, after the battle, after the war, after the trial. It was a battle that she helped 
lead. A battle that she helped to happen and she inspired. And she accomplished this. Everybody think, think about this. She accomplished this in a male dominant society. You think, you think we have unequality problems now, ladies? Oh, listen, the ladies back then, the women back then were held just above slaves. I'm, I'm being totally serious. And in that environment, she rose to the very top of leadership as a judge and as a rescuer of Israel. And I, it's, it's, if you're taking notes, which I'm sorry, it's dark, but you, have, you, you know, do the best that you can or use your phone. If you're taking notes, it's worth noting that she is the only judge out of 12. Remember, this book of Judges happened over a 300-year period from Joshua to King Saul. And she was the only judge out of 12 that the Scripture has nothing bad to say about her. The other judges had their issues. We talked about Samson a couple of weeks. His whole life was an issue. Come on. Ehud, we talked about Ehud. Ehud was, did a great job, but remember, he chickened out before he actually finished the job, right? Remember that. There's nothing like that in the scripture about Deborah. She is a shining example of character, of godly character and leadership that we can follow to us. We can, we can follow that. She trusted God. And she was used mightily of him regardless of the circumstances, regardless of her culture, and regardless of the obstacles that were facing her. Today, folks, we're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about... Now, Pastor Allen, time out. Not everybody is called to leadership, right? I mean, not every, I am shy. I mean, the idea of getting in front of a group and leading and talking absolutely terrifies me. Not everybody is called to leadership. Come on. What was Jesus' great commission before he left? Was it just to a group of people? Was it just to some Christians? What did he say? Go into all the world and what? Make disciples. Make disciples. Look on the screen. We can't make disciples without influence. And we don't have influence without leadership. We can't make disciples without influence. And we don't have influence without leadership because leadership is simply influence. That's all it is. If you're a Christian, listen, you are called to lead. Turn to somebody. I know you love it when pastors do this. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking to you. Seriously, he's talking to you. I know y'all love that when pastors do that. We do that because we know you don't like it. And it keeps you awake and engaged. And we, it's because we can. Just, just being totally honest with you. Now, listen, there are different levels of leadership. We're not all going to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. We're not all going to be a head of state. We're not all going to serve in the Senate or in Congress. We're not all going to even pastor a church. I want you to hear me. Hear me today. Each of us has a capacity to lead that God wants to tap into to further his kingdom. I didn't put that on the screen. I probably should have. If you want to write that down, each of us has a capacity to lead. Every single one of us has a capacity to lead that the Father wants to tap into and develop for his kingdom. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe it. So Deborah was an incredible woman of God and an amazing leader. We're going to circle back to that same scripture at the end to pull our big idea, but we're going to start at the beginning of her story in Judges chapter 4. And as we always do, we're going to read through and just pull the, the, big, the, the points and the takeaways as we go. So Judges chapter 4, verse 1. After Ehud's death, after remember him? We talked about him in the first week. After he went and assassinated the, the King Eglon of Moab, and then he led the battle, they had 80 years of peace. But when he died and that generation died, the next generation came along and forgot what God had done. And they went back 
to their old ways of idolatry, forgetting God. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Haggim. I have no idea that's how you say that. You can do better. Come on. Verse 3, Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. These iron chariots would have been the equivalent to Nazis' tanks in World War II. They were far better and far greater than any of the technology of that day. That's one of the reasons they were able to go as far as they did in their campaign. So this was serious technology for the day. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. You remember the pattern? Here we are again. They rebel. They're judged by God. They last as long as they can, in this case, 20 years. They remember God, duh. They call out to God. They repent of their sin. And God sends rescue. And God sends help. Verse 4, Deborah, the wife of Lipidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah. She had her own tree. How about that? She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her. Everybody say, go to her. her. Folks, I don't think you understand how amazing this is in this time period. How unusual. They would go to her for judgment. Now, forget the idea of a person with a black robe in a courtroom with a bailiff. That's not the kind of judge she was. She was just so wise and so close to the Lord that people were drawn to her for basically advice and arbitration. And they would come to her and she would hear them and she would give them advice. Remember Dear Abby? Kind of like that, but ramped up to a very much better level, okay? So that's what we're we're talking about in this case. So verse 6, one day she sent for Barak, who was a general, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. But here's the deal. She sends for this general, but he lives 70 miles away. Now to us, that's no big deal. Well, actually, it would be very inconvenient. I would not want to do that either. But to us, we can jump in the car and be there in an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. Not the case back then. We just read a scripture about how dangerous it was to travel, about how they had to take back roads to get there. This would have taken days to get there, and it would have been a dangerous trip. And yet, Barak comes. Now think about that. I think this speaks volumes as to her influence and her leadership, that this guy would drop everything and travel 70 miles to meet with her. So here's my first point. Great leaders inspire sacrificial action. Great leaders inspire sacrificial action. Do you think for a second this man, Barak, would have dropped everything and taken this journey for just anyone? Would you? I mean, we don't just, you don't just drop everything, your plans, your schedule, what you have for the day for just anyone. But listen to me. People will sacrifice for great leaders because great leadership is rare. People will sacrifice for great leaders because great leadership is rare. We've seen it from the beginning of time. People will sacrifice for people they believe in and that have a vision they know they can trust. Deborah was that great leader, and we can learn from her. Let's continue this story. So Deborah said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Okay, so that's why she didn't just send a messenger boy to give him a message. This was a word from God. She didn't want to just send a text message. Some things are more important, amen? Some things need to be delivered face to face. This was a word from God, and she needed him right there. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Everybody say you. Was 
the command to Deborah or to Barak? To Barak. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor, and I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. There I, God, will give you the victory over him. So everybody look at me. This is a direct word from God through the trusted prophet, the trusted rescuer, the trusted judge, of Israel, Deborah, to fight. And if you fight, I will give you the victory. Easy peasy, right? That's easy. I mean, Adrian, I'd love to have something that clear. Come on. We know it's from God because Deborah is a trusted prophet. And he said, if you'll fight, I'll give you the victory. Verse 8, Barak told her, I will go but only if you go with me. I'll go, but only if you go with me. This woman, Deborah, must have been something else. She must have inspired so much confidence and peace and assurance. Have you ever been around somebody like that? Do you know anybody like that? Somebody that you just kind of change your schedule to try to meet up with them. You, you do whatever you can and work it out to accidentally run across their path. I'm not talking about boyfriends and girlfriends. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody you just want to be around. You feel more at peace when you're around them. You feel more confident when you're around them. You feel God when you're around them. Can I tell you that it's God's desire that you be that person? Woo! My God, I felt that. My Lord. About 20 of you agree with that. Listen. No, 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 no. God wants you to be that person. It's God's will for you to be that person. Look at the screen. God... Great leaders inspire confidence. Great leaders inspire confidence. I make it a matter of prayer, staff, every day, that I somehow can inspire confidence in my staff as I lead them and as we lead the church, that they would be confident in the direction that we're going, even if they don't agree or, or whatever, that they, there would still be confidence that I'm hearing from God. I pray that I inspire you and confidence in you as, as those who are really connected to new life, that you would be confident in the direction that our church is going. But you know what? Most importantly, I pray I inspire confidence in these folks right over here, my family. The word of God says, if you gain the whole world and lose your family, what good is it? They're first, folks. They are first. They are first. They always will be. You know, a lot of people say they always have been, they always will be. They haven't always been. When I was young in ministry, I made those mistakes of putting the church, putting my ministry job position in front not going to happen. Men, can I talk to you for a second? I know that not every home is ideal in a biblical sense with a man and a wife and a mom and a dad. I know, I'm not stupid. I know 50% of marriages end in divorce. But men who have families, listen to me. You have been called biblically to be the priest of your home, to lead your families, but that doesn't happen automatically. You have to earn that. Our families need to know they can count on us, men. They need to be confident in us to provide for them, to protect them, to love them, and to lead them. They need to be confident in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm talking to somebody right now. Our families, men, need to know that we love 
Jesus. That we walk daily with the Lord. They need to see evidence of that. Not just what we say, but what we do. They need to walk in on us reading our Bible. They need to come in on us when we're praying and, and seeking God. They need to know that we are walking with God, trusting God as we lead them, our family. Come on, somebody. And for all of those homes and those single moms out there, God gives a special grace to you. Can we give it up right now for our single moms who are doing a fantastic job? <laughs> about six years ago, we were about to go on vacation. We were in Mobile, Alabama, south, way down at the bottom of Alabama. And so it was a long way anywhere, wherever we went. And I think maybe we were coming back to Tennessee, but it was a seven, eight hour drive. And at that time, Rachel was about six years old. Yes, this is another one about you, Rachel. You have good material. <laughs> and at that time, she was really, really, really into hula hooping. I've got videos of her. She could hula hoop around her head, her neck, her arms, her legs. It didn't matter. She could hula hoop and hula hoop and hula hoop. And so we were getting ready to leave and back the van out. And here she came with this gigantic hula hoop. And all I could imagine was that hula hoop banging the back of my head, trying to drive or going around my neck, you know, while I'm trying to have a wreck or whatever. And so she's starting to get in. I said, Rachel, you can't bring that on the trip. It's too big for the van. And she said, but mom said, <laughs> and it wasn't even, but mom said I could. It was mom said, if you said it was Okay. Even worse. <laughs> Sometimes the view from the bus under the bus is really good. <laughs> so I said, Rachel, Rachel, I rarely, I rarely do this. I rarely do this. But I'm the man of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to put my foot down. You cannot bring that hula hoop. Well, that face, you know, and just she, she thought about arguing, but she... To her credit, she went ahead and she put the thing up. So we're closed up. We're getting ready to pull out of the driveway. And I had that thought, did I lock the front door? You know, did I lock the door? So I put it back in park and I said, hey, Rachel, run out and just check the door and make sure it's locked. And she didn't, didn't, there was no beat. I mean, immediately she said, well, you're the man of the house. You go do it. And I did. <laughs> Back to Deborah. Back to Deborah. Barack, so Barack, Barack says, I'll go, but I want you to go with me. Now, folks, I've said it before in this message already, but this is just unheard of. This is unheard of for what she was already doing as a judge. It was already unheard of, but now to lead into combat, into battle. It, 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 it was just unheard of for the time. And you know what? Really, for any culture, in any time, do you know that it's only been in the last two years, two years, that the ban was lifted for women to be able to train and serve on the front lines of combat in the United States? Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to start a fight or an argument. I'm not male, a male chauvinist. You, I've got, I've got three daughters and, and empowering them and a wife who preaches and all that stuff, so don't, you know, keep your emails to yourself. But listen, <laughs> there's, <laughs> listen, there's just something that doesn't feel right to me about sending our daughters to the front lines. Amen. It's just to me. Now, that's, that's, that's to me. And I think Deborah felt the same way. I think she got that. I think she understood there's, God's created men and women differently, completely equal Amen. in his sight, yeah. but different, come on, yeah. with different strengths, different weaknesses, not to be in conflict, but to complement. So I think she said, 
I think with a little smirk or a grin or something on her face, I think she said, verse 9, very well. I'll go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. I bet his cheeks and just burned red, especially if he had any of his buddies standing around. Are you getting this? Are you getting the feel for this? Are you get, are sensing the tension and just what's happening? Bottom line here, Barak was shunning his responsibility. God told him to lead the army into battle, not Deborah. There was something lacking in him that was keeping him from his destiny. And that thing and that substance that was lacking was faith. God was setting Barak up to be the hero. We should have been talking about him today. But his lack of faith was holding him back. And folks, when we don't trust God with every part of our life, every aspect of our life, it holds us back too. Deborah had stronger faith because she walked closer to God. Now, the next few minutes in this scripture, I want you to pay attention. Listen. God downloaded some things in the next few minutes that, that I've studied this week that have blown my mind. I've never seen these things before. I want you to really, really dig in and pay attention. Listen to this. Barak decided he was going to lean on her faith to fight his battles. Barak decided that he was going to lean on her faith to fight his his battle, and how often do we do the same thing? We lean on someone else's faith, someone else's relationship with God to fight our battle. Now, I know, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear the grace here. Grace and truth, right? That's what we do here. Truth and grace. I know there are seasons of time that we're more vulnerable, that we're weaker, that we're going through a crisis, maybe a health issue or, or a, you know, some crisis in our life where we have to lean on other people. We have to lean on stronger people. That, I'm not saying that at all. We, matter of fact, if we, you know, that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have the great song. Lean on me if you're not strong and I'll be I'll help you carry on for, come on, it won't be long till I'm going to need somebody. Very good. <laughs> I, was, I was actually really worried you weren't going to sing at all, and I was going to be like, this is really dumb. <laughs> but here's the deal. There are those seasons, but those seasons can't turn into years. I want you to hear me. Relationships are strained and eventually break if only one person is carrying the load. I didn't put that on the screen. You might want to write that down. Relationships are strained and eventually break when only one person is carrying the load all the time. That's, that's between friends, that's marriages, whatever. All right, let's, let's do this. On a scale from 1 to 10, we're going to do a little evaluation. Scale from 1 to 10, 10 being the strongest, 1 being absolutely horribly weak. How would you rank your faith right now? Right now, not yesterday, not what you think it's going to be tomorrow, not your friend, your faith right now, in this moment, 1 to 10. Get a number in your head. How would you rank your ability right now to trust and rest in God's word for your life? So if it's a 6, we're just going to pull a number out. Not because it's me, but anyway. If it's a <laughs> How confident are you in me now if I say I'm a six? <laughs> if it's a six, listen, if it's a six, who are you leaning on for the four? If you're a six, 
or of Europe, whatever, who are you leaning on for the deficit? Are you leaning on God or someone else? I want to look at a, a, a story in the New Testament quickly that I've read a thousand times and so have you and, and it's, 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 I'm seeing it totally, totally different because God spoke this to me this week. This is Mark chapter 9 and let me give you a back story. This man brought his son to the disciples to deliver from a demon. He was demon possessed and the disciples could not cast the demon out. And then Jesus came along Mark chapter 9, 21, Jesus says, How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, Since he was a little boy. The Spirit often throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Verse 23. <laughs> what do you mean if I can? That gives me shivers. <laughs> what? Do, what? Do, where have you been, sir? I've been doing this for two years. Where, where have you been? What do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible for a 10 out of 10. Come on, follow me. How many know if we had a 10 out of 10 faith, we could say to that mountain, move, and it would. Come on. I'm being real in this house. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. I do believe. I do believe that help me with my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe. My God. I do believe. That helped me overcome my unbelief. Oh, hallelujah. I have Jesus, 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 listen to me. I have a level of faith. I do. Because I know. How many uh, know that Jesus is the Messiah in this house? Come on, raise your hand. You know Jesus is the Lord. You know he raised from the dead. You know that he is able to heal and to set free. If, you, if you're a Christian, you have at least a one. Come on, celebrate the one. I'm a one, Lord, help me with the nine. I'll give you a chance to do that in just a minute. We're going to pray. I have a level of faith, God, that help me overcome my deficit. I've always read this scripture and scratched my head thinking, well, do you believe or don't you? Do you believe or don't you believe? The answer is both. Amen. And the answer for us is both. Amen. But the key, listen to me, here's the deal. Here's the key, here's the key. He didn't go to somebody else for the deficit. He asked Jesus. He asked Jesus to help him overcome the deficit. Why? Because if we're constantly putting the deficit on somebody else, guess what? They have a deficit too. They have a deficit too and we're just adding to it. Jesus is the one we need to go to for our deficit of faith. Come on, look at the screen, look at the screen. Great leaders learn to trust God with the faith they have and with the faith they need. Now give him the praise, come on. Great leaders, godly leaders, understand, they've evaluated. They're not satisfied. Oh, ho, ho. no, I'm not satisfied with this. Anybody else? I'm not satisfied with that. But they understand that there is a deficit and they don't throw it on somebody else. They go to Jesus for the deficit. Great leaders learn to trust God with the faith they have and with the faith they need. Barak was doing the exact opposite. Go back to our story. 
So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Come on, Barak, let's go. I'll hold your hand. Come on, let's go. Skip to verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone to, up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all his warriors, and they marched from Harosh Hagiot yeah, to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, get ready. Everybody say, get ready. get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. Verse 15, when Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the, the, the chariots and the enemy all the way to that name again, killing all, of, <laughs> killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one of them was left alive. Is this not what God said was going to happen? Is this not what God said was going to happen. He said, if you fight, I'll go before you and fight for you and I'll give you the victory. This should have been and could have been Barak's finest hour. But let me tell you why we are preaching about Deborah today and not Barak. Deborah believed in God. Barak believed in Deborah. Deborah believed in an unseen promise from God, but Barak was limited by what he could see. Deborah believed in a preferred, blessed future that God had for them. Barak was trapped in the moment. Look at the screen. Great leaders have great vision. Great leaders have great vision. Great leaders don't get stuck in their present circumstances. Great leaders are able to envision, listen, envision the possibilities, even with the obstacle right in their face. It's an amazing thing, and I pray that God continues to give it to me and ramps it up. Somebody pray with me that he would do that. But listen, I used to play peekaboo with my girls with that. Sorry, total random thought. Regardless of the obstacles, even if it's right in their faith, they ha face, they have this ability to see around the corner in the spirit to what the possibilities are that God has for them. Great leaders have great vision by God. Even though they can't physically see it, they can envision it. Michelangelo finished his masterpiece, David, the sculpture David, standing over 14 feet with one solid piece of marble. And he finished that. People marveled, of course, as they still do. And they asked him, how in the world did you accomplish that? He said, it really wasn't that hard. I could see David before I ever started. So all I had to do was remove what wasn't supposed to be there. Great leaders. Have great vision. Verse 23, I'm trying to wrap up. This is good, though. I'm enjoying this. So on that day, Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from the time, that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Okay, so God once again rescues Israel, and they defeat their enemies. In closing, I want to go back to the original song that she wrote in Judges 5 to pull our big idea. Verse 6, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Get the picture. Travelers looked, took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. Here's the key verse. God chose new leaders. When war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000. In Israel, during a time of extreme and dangerous conditions, God was looking for leadership. The enemy was at the gate, but nobody was willing to fight or to lead until this amazing woman of God stepped up to the plate and gave us an example of great leadership. And folks, look at me. I say our conditions today are just as extreme. They're different, but they are extreme nonetheless. Would you agree? 
Look around the world. The enemy is most certainly at our gate. The enemy prowls and seeks whom he may devour. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to disrupt your life and keep you from, his, uh, from your purpose. The enemy is most certainly at the gate. But God is looking for leaders who will step up. And listen to me. He's not worried or concerned about whether you're male or female. Come on. Young or old, rich or poor, red, yellow, black, or white. The big idea is that God will make a leader out of anyone who is available. God will make a leader out of anyone who is available. Here's the challenge. Did we do the three by five card? Did y'all get three by five cards? Here's what I want you to do. We had some confusion with the lighting. You were supposed to get three by five cards when you came in. That's okay. That's okay. What I want you to do is take something. You can use a, a tithing envelope or you can put it in your phone. And I want you to write down one word one thing, listen, one thing that you can do this week to improve your leadership. One thing that you can do this, not 10 things, because that will overwhelm you and you won't do anything. Write down one thing that you can do. It might be to go out on a must ministries route tomorrow. It might be, hey, young people, listen to me. Don't put some profound thing down there if your room is a mess. Maybe cleaning your room is the first thing that you need to do and respect the home that you have and your parents and honor them. How about that? That's a good thing to put down to improve your leadership. Come on, parents. Help me. Listen, one thing, maybe it's to start a quiet time with the Lord. Maybe it's to join one of the many ministries at this church and get involved. Maybe it's to begin giving and paying tithes like the Word of God instructs us. One thing, one thing. If your marriage, listen, if your marriage is suffering, may I suggest that your one thing is to own up to that, to come together and to seek help. Maybe that's your one thing. One thing that will improve your leadership. Would you bow your heads?